Despite everything written about Jimi Hendrix since his death, vital questions remain unanswered. the joker to the thief There's far too much confusion and I can't Since 1970, declassified government documents, new witness statements and pathological evidence have revealed a much clearer picture. It is now clear that Hendrix was not only aware that his life was in danger, but that he had deep, strong premonitions of his own death. No what any of this is really worth. He looked me square in the eyes and said, I won't be here. And I said, what do you mean won't be here? He says, is it because I, I won't be in my body, I'll be dead. Out of the blue, uh, he said to the reporter, I doubt I'll live to be 28 years old. There's no reason to get excited. I'd asked him, would he be going, would he be going back to Seattle? He's like, he said, next time I go to Seattle, it'll be in a pine box. There are many here among us now. And now, with the examination of declassified FBI documents from the 60s, it appears that Hendrix's death may be far more sinister, a political assassination. The 1960s saw a sea change in American politics and culture. The anti-Vietnam demonstrations and the rise of the Black Power movement caused rioting in the streets. A new youth culture emerged in both the black and white communities. A paranoid Richard Nixon and the FBI's J. Edgar Hoover would go to any lengths to prevent the emergence of strong leaders that could influence these young men and women, even murder. Potential leaders included rock musicians who commanded the attention of millions. Hendrix linked up with the Black Panthers, and for that reason, he was a dead man. Two people are central to the Hendrix story. One is his manager, Mike Jeffrey. Mike Jeffries was a very strange, slightly shady character that sort of existed on the managerial sort of aspect of rock music. Always walked around in dark glasses with a kind of off-the-shoulder camel hair coat and things, you know, and looked a bit like a kind of caricature mafia, um, spoke in a whisper. Um, he wasn't terribly well liked, as far as I recall. Everybody was very suspicious of Mike Jeffries, and I think with some genuine reasons. The second person is Monica Danneman, a 24-year-old German woman who spent the last few days of Jimmy's life with him. Monica was a kind of like ex- ice skating star that was sort of show business character, you know, and she wanted to get her foot in the door, I think, of, uh, of um, celebrity rock, rock doom, and Jimmy was a, a great entrance. Monica's memories of the day before Jimmy died were dim, but she remembered going to Ronnie Scott's club so Jimmy could jam with Eric Burden and his new band, War. Devon Wilson was already at the club. Devon had known Jimmy for some years. Devon had come up the hard way, a prostitute on the streets of New York at 15, and now a muse to various rock stars, including Mick Jagger and Jimmy. Jimmy's sexual appetite was enormous, and Devon would organize his diary, recording sessions, drugs, and women. Devon was bisexual and did not give up her female lovers for Jimmy. In fact, she would organize the threesomes Jimmy loved. Jimmy probably loved Devon, it was said that Devon could score dope for Jimmy anywhere in the world. It was Chaz Chandler, bass player in The Animals, who discovered the unknown and penniless Jimi Hendrix playing at the Café Wa in New York. Acting on a hunch and his musical knowledge, he sold his guitars and borrowed money to bring Hendrix to London. He went out on a considerable limb, um, as far as I was concerned, because when I first saw Jimmy, which was on his first day in London, and Chas rang me up and said, he's arrived, and I'm taking him down to the speakeasy tonight. Do you want to come down and, and meet him and hear him jam? And I went down and listened to him play that night, and he was jamming with Brian Auger and a few other musicians down there, just the speakeasy house band. Uh, and he was magnificent. He was wonderful uh, as a musician. But to me, it was like listening to somebody like Wes Montgomery, you know, because he was such a clever musician. And I just said to Chaz, quite honestly, Chaz, I said, I, I can see this going straight over the heads 
for the fans. Mm -hmm. I cannot see this guy making it because he's almost too good. You know, and Charles said, not if I have anything to do with it, he won't. And of course, what he really meant was that he was going to change his image, uh, change his um, uh, publicity and his whole approach to things so that he would get the attention that perhaps, as a mere technician, he wouldn't have done previously. In the story of Jimi Hendrix, we cut to probably September, October. We're back in London and Eric calls up, Eric Clapton and says that we're doing a gig tonight at University College. Could you please come? Because the guest we've got tonight is just probably the greatest guy I've ever met. So everybody's working hard and we all play hard and we all turned up. And um, Eric had played a couple of numbers when he stops and did the most phenomenal introduction for this guy. And out came Jimi Hendrix. And he played the same set he'd played in New York. But it was just, it was like 10, 10 steps up from what he played before because the crowd was so much bigger. And I looked at Andrew, Andrew looked at me and, and we both agreed, yeah, we've got to sign him. It was too late. Little did we know that Linda Keith had taken Chaz Chandler to see Jimmy the Falling Night and he signed him. One of the uh, first times he had a chance to play for the English Hines, uh, was with The Cream, and uh, The Cream were just getting started out, of course, Eric Clapton on lead guitar, and uh, nobody had ever jammed with him before. I mean, it was just like, who is Jimi Hendrix, and why does he want to jam with us? But sure enough, he talked his way into meeting Jack Bruce at a, uh, at a pub uh, close by and said, you know, hey, I'd like to jam with you. I'm Jimi Hendrix, I'm over here from, from America, and uh, he came up on stage, played two songs with The Cream, two blues songs that he updated uh, with a, this driving electric sound, and Clapton was blown away, according to uh, Jack Bruce. He said that uh, nobody had ever done this before, and uh, here comes Jimi Hendrix coming along, setting up the uh, great electric blues guitar players of that time, like Jeff Beck and Pete Townsend, who were kind of, I, I guess, a little bit uh, scared of, who's this guy that can play circles around this? Distasteful though it may seem to us today, Chaz Chandler dubbed Hendrix the Wild Man of Borneo, and sold him as the Black Elvis. Chaz Chandler encouraged these crass expressions because it increased Jimmy's publicity. He was also dubbed Mau Mau, and not surprisingly denounced by Mary Whitehouse. Hey, hey Joe, I said. I heard you shot your woman down, you shot her down now. Within weeks, Hey Joe shot into the British Top Ten to be followed by the hugely well-received debut album Are You Experienced, which was kept off the top of the charts only by Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yes, I did, I shot him. You know, I kind of mess around, mess around town. In the summer of 1967, Jimmy played the Monterey International Pop Festival, and stole the show. Overnight, he became a superstar on both sides of the Atlantic. His appeal to the kids no doubt strengthened by this coruscating review of Are You Experienced, which appeared in the New York Times. The album cover reinforces the degeneracy theme, with the three sneering out from beneath their bouffant hairdos, looking like surreal hermaphrodites. The disc itself is a nightmare show with lust and misery. The explosion, I think, was caused by the, I don't know, the war in Vietnam, the rebellion against it, uh, the uh, flower power era, you know, um, the hippie movement or whatever you want to call it. And uh, acts like Jimi Hendrix were so different that the kids were yearning for something different. And when he came on the scene, he just exploded. I mean, everybody went crazy. I went crazy. It was so new. and. Um, and different, and he was so, uh, oh, um, I saw him live so many times. He was so magnetic on stage. I mean, he just controlled the audience. And um, it was an exciting time. I mean, um, a lot of bands, you know, who broke at that particular time uh, with Hendrix. I mean, it was just a whole different scene. He differed 
from the top acts at that time. And I mean, his sound was so different than the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or something like that. And plus, I think being an African-American in both the American audience and the English audience was a plus in his favor. I mean, there weren't any African-American guitar players at that time playing rock and roll to a white audience and getting the respect and uh, appreciation that he did, you know? What happened next became a rocket ride of more success, more and more sex, and huge amounts of drugs and rock and roll. After returning from Ronnie Scott's club on the day before he died, Jimmy, Monica, and Devon got together. Monica says Jimmy spoke to them of many things, astrology, cosmology, art, music, religion, and voodoo symbols. Together, they sketched out artwork designs for the next album cover. Jimmy also warned Monica off drugs and told her to beware of those who might want to harm her because she was with him. Jimmy emphasized over and over, you must remember what I am telling you. Monica told the inquest that Devon left and she and Jimmy went to bed. This is the first of many inconsistencies in Monica Danneman's story, although the inquest into Jimmy's death believed her. Over 20 years later, Kathy Etchingham, a longtime girlfriend of Hendrix and archivist Steve Roby, re-examined all of Monica's testimony and found glaringly irreconcilable differences. Kathy discovered that Hendrix had been with friend and producer Alan Douglas. So. Hendrix had begged Douglas to take over his management. Michael Jeffrey, he said, was stealing vast amounts of money from him and stultifying his creativity. Jimmy told Alan that some months ago, three thugs claiming to be Mafia Hoods had kidnapped him and held him prisoner for three days until he was miraculously rescued by Mike Jeffrey. Jimmy thought Jeffrey had staged the whole thing to make him seem indispensable as manager. Alan and Jimmy made several decisions that would affect his future, most of them cutting Mike Jeffrey out of the picture completely. The next morning, Alan Douglas left for New York City on business for Jimmy, leaving him in bed with his wife Stella and Devon Wilson. <laughs> Epstein, as we all know, was the Beatles manager, and he loved theatre, and he bought what was called the Savile Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue, and it was for straight theatre plays during the week, and the Sunday night he attempted to turn into like a Sunday night rock night, Sunday night with your rock and roll stars, and he called us and said, would you please be my guest tonight on Sunday, uh, because it's Jimi Hendrix. And we went, and it was probably the top of the graph of the reaction. He was at a peak. He did all the hits. He set fire to the guitar. He, he threw He played it behind his neck. He did everything. And that really is my last memory of seeing Jimi Hendrix, because it was a night of nights. And it's one of those that you take away in your own encyclopedia. And to have seen him again would probably have destroyed the myth. Axis Boulder's Love was Hendrix's next album, and it sold prodigiously, pleasing immensely his fans worldwide. Axis Boulder's Love had a great variety of songs on it. I mean, you'd have a bit of R&B going to jazz influences by Mose Allison, and uh, of course the occasional freak out song coming in here and there. And then um, there were some beautiful melodies in there. And uh, of course, you know, the great, uh, almost kind of, kind of became the uh, 
the song of the hippies there back then, if six was nine, you know. For many of Jimmy's fans, Axis Boulder's Love was Jimmy's last great rock and roll album, and it marked the end of an era of Hendrix, the black rocker, and started a new era with Jimmy's music becoming more spiritual and in many ways not commercially viable. Well, even while he was alive, there was no corporate interest in having Jimmy be anything more than sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Hendrix started to realize that, well, it's not so much the quick AM pop tunes that interest him anymore, and he didn't really care where his music was going chart-wise. It was more trying to reach people's souls and give them some sort of direction and information in the music that uh, he was more interested in. Frustrated with Jimmy's stubborn attitude to the music he wanted to play, Jazz Chandler sold his share of Jimmy to Mike Jeffrey. Hendrix and Jeffrey would have continual financial problems with each other. Hendrix because he was receiving no money, and Jeffrey because Hendrix had no sense of musical discipline in the studio. Hendrix became aware that he was being stolen from by Michael Jeffrey when friends of his came to him with documents that they had procured from Michael Jeffrey's office. And the documents showed that he had been stealing $40,000 from, from gigs. And at the time, Jimi Hendrix was making $50,000. So he was stealing four-fifths of the money. He needed somebody to tell him the truth. Because he was in that situation recording-wise again, where he went into a studio for like about three months, you know, out of his head, wasted the recording time a lot of the time, spent huge amounts of money, and out of it would come a rambling kind of dissertation of music that he quite liked. But what it didn't have was that discipline that R.U. experienced and Purple Haze and all those early albums from Electric Ladyland had that Chaz gave to that kind of music, you know. Chaz would sit in the studio and say, right, go away, play. Because Jimmy played quite loosely in the studio. Now, financial problems would haunt Hendrix to the grave. As a young, naive sideman with Curtis Knight and the Squires, he had signed a ludicrous contract with a producer, Ed Chalpin, granting Chalpin the right to huge royalties in return for a buyout of one dollar and Chalpin's expertise in the recording studio. Chalpin's expertise involved Jimmy recording with the glamour actress Jane Mansfield. The majority of Hendrix's earnings were paid into a secretive Bahamas-based trust called Yemeta, set up by Mike Jeffrey. Most of the millions that went into it never came out. Jimmy's deal gave him just 3% of his recording and publishing deals, while Jeffrey took an astonishing 60%. Chalpin pursued his claim on Jimmy's royalties through the courts, and with a dispute in progress, all Jimmy's royalties were frozen. Jimmy was forced to face down these money issues, but there were those in the industry who doubted his abilities when it came to confrontation. He was quite a, an introverted man. He was in some ways a rather weak man. He was very lovable, very likable, but he was weak. He, he was the kind of guy who would, couldn't say no. Jimmy was a massively talented musician whose whole being really went into the guitar and into his music and into his work and he got out whatever he could by communicating through his song lyrics and things, his feelings and uh, some of his inner uh, desires. But he became incredibly mixed up too, even in those areas. I mean, he really couldn't tell the difference between facts and fantasy a lot of the time. He got heavily into science fiction and cult stuff and all kinds of this because he was looking for something. He was searching. You have to remember he was only 25, 24 anyway. So like a lot of young people at that time, particularly in that period in the 60s, they were all kind of trying out the Maharishi and the um, love and cult situations that were around. And there was an interest in Aleister Crowley and black magic and all kinds of stuff. And Jimmy kind of like dabbled in all those areas. But I think as he went along, he became increasing, found it increasingly difficult to tell the difference between what was actually reality and what was fantasy. Hendrix was just a very talented guy who didn't have a lot of backbone. According to Monica Dannemann's testimony to the inquest, 
Jimmy's last day on Earth was spent with just the two of them walking, talking and shopping. They attended a party together and were home by 1 a.m. She made Jimmy a tuna fish sandwich and they shared a bottle of white wine. They undressed and went quietly and peacefully to bed. Once again, Kathy Etchingham and Steve Roby found that the truth was somewhat different. September 17, 1970. Jimmy was uh, doing some marketing at Kensington Market and uh, was going to stop by his hotel room uh, at the Cumberland Hotel to pick up some of his messages. On the way to the Cumberland Hotel, uh, Jimmy uh, was stopped in traffic and uh, looked over to the side and there was uh, two young lovely ladies that were catching his attention and invited them to come back later to their apartment to serve him some uh, dinner. They showed up uh, with Monica, they had some, some dinner, they rolled him fresh joints, just pampered him intensely, poured him wine, he felt like a king. All, all this time though, Monica was growing more jealous by the minute. Uh, Jimmy tried to calm her down, finally got her back in, but it, it wasn't working. It, these two young ladies were obviously ca capturing the attention, his attention, and Monica wasn't having it. She finally got up, walked out. Jimmy apologized like the gentleman he was. Um, he had this party to attend to by himself, mind you. He didn't invite Monica along and went to this party at about, oh, one in the morning. About a half hour after he'd been there, Monica was at the door. Jimmy. Can I see Jimmy? Can Jimmy come out? And Jimmy was just embarrassed by her still. I mean, this, this argument obviously had lingered. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy tried to get uh, some of the people at the party to send her away. Yeah, I'm busy. I'm having a good time. Go away, Monica. But it wasn't working. Finally, about after an hour and a half or two hours later, she finally convinced Jimmy to leave this party. And this was about 3 in the morning. Some people say that uh, Jimmy would probably want to go back to his hotel room at the Cumberland, but his black and white Strat, one of his favorite guitars, was at Monica's flat out there. So he returned with her. In 1968, Jimmy moved to New York to record his next album to be titled Electric Ladyland, with Mike Jeffrey, as usual, complaining about the soaring studio costs. Devon Wilson was organizing the availability of two of Jimmy's greatest needs, groupies and drugs. Jimmy would often come home to find a room full of naked young women. There must be a way that is out of here, said the joker to the thief. The amount of LSD taken by Jimmy was hugely embellished by his fans, who, imitating their hero, dropped even more. Businessmen, they drink my wine. Plowmen, they dig my earth. People would often drop LSD into Jimmy's drink, assuming that he would want to get high. People said Jimmy shot LSD into his temple, the side of his head, to achieve a more vivid trip. And how Jimmy loved to trip. But Jimmy's real addiction was playing. Any way, any how, anywhere. Later in 1968, Jimmy moved to Los Angeles and became a regular at the Whiskey A Go Go. Jimmy loved LA. He liked hanging out there every day. There was nothing Jimmy liked more than to drive around Los Angeles at night while both stoned and tripping. He was now receiving substantial amounts of money. He would buy a car, smash it to pieces because of his poor eyesight, and replace it the same day with another new car. Jimmy was constantly stoned while finishing the recording of Electric Ladyland, which on its release in November 1968 went straight to number one in the American and UK charts. It was at this point that Jimmy first became aware that amongst his followers were members of the Black Panther Party. 
Hendrix's link to the Black Panthers would prove to be a major factor in how his future was shaped. Jimmy said, They come to concerts, and I sort of feel them there. It's not a physical thing, but a mental ray. It's a spiritual thing. On the issue of black power, Hendrix started to make some ill-advised statements to magazines and newspapers. Well, I think Jimi Hendrix was on safe ground as long as he was apolitical. And he really didn't have much interest in all of this until the Black Panthers came along and worked on his sense of compunction. And therefore, he made statements in the teen press about the Black Panthers going to Washington and actually killing people and so forth. And he, he said it sounded like war, but that's what we have to have. We need war. Well, you talk that way, they take notice in Washington, D.C. At the insistence of Warner Brothers, his record label, Hendrix was obliged to settle the suit with Ed Chalpin, the terms of which required Hendrix to deliver a whole new album to Chalpin's company, a cash settlement and an agreement giving Chalpin a percentage of all his future royalties. Now, Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, both tired of Jimmy's tantrums, left the band. To compound his misery, Hendrix was stopped by customs at Toronto Airport. They found a bag of heroin in his luggage. You know, being associated with coming across the border with heroin in your flight bag put a, put a different image on him and his fans, although I would say probably the hardcore fans maybe were a lot more forgiving on that. But, you know, heroin wasn't the drug at the time. Uh, cocaine was just starting to rear its ugly head. And he, he admitted that he had tried cocaine several times, but not, not heroin. As a non-heroin user, Jimmy believed he'd been set up by Mike Jeffrey, who was still attempting to make himself indispensable to Hendrix. Jeffrey was stealing money from him, sabotaging his career, planning people around him to spy on him and to subvert his own activities, his own life. And Hendrix, yeah, he had a growing awareness that this was happening to him and he knew who to blame. Hendrix was also in conflict with Mike Jeffrey over musical direction. Jeffrey wanted him to write and record rock music. He'd made a lot of money out of it and wanted that to continue. For Jimmy, however, his new musical direction was his sole obligation, despite what the critics might say. There were a few uh, white critics in some of the uh, rock magazines that totally didn't understand it and said, well, what are you doing, you know? Get back to the original format. And that's what Michael Je Jeffrey did in 1970. He, he, took an attempt to reform the original experience with Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding and did an interview uh, with uh, Rolling Stone magazine in February of 1970 saying that they were, here they are, they're back together again, you know, like the Beatles, the monkeys, they're back together again, kids, and here they're going out on the States, they're going around the world, and buy your concert tickets now. Woodstock was probably Hendrix's last great hurrah. As 1970 began, and despite forming the Band of Gypsies with Billy Cox on bass and Buddy Miles on drums, Jimmy's depression had become a real problem. More problems were emerging every day. The Electric Lady Studios he was building in New York City were two months behind schedule, and to make matters worse, they were being built in a Mafia-controlled area. The Mafia did not want the studios. Studios meant musicians, musicians meant drugs, and drugs meant more police. Jimmy had several run-ins with Mafia Hoods in New York, but once again, Mike Jeffrey was on hand to sort things out. Jimmy was intrigued by how well Jeffrey seemed to know them. By 1970, many celebrities were attending anti-Vietnam war rallies and Black Panther fundraisers, as well as contributing considerable amounts of cash. Amongst them was Jimi Hendrix. On January the 28th, 1970, Jimi played a benefit for the Vietnam Moratorium Committee. On stage, Jimi looked as if he was dead. He'd been given some bad acid. Try as he might, Jimi could not play. He told the audience, we can't get it together and walked off stage. Yeah. 
Jimmy was becoming deeply entrenched with the black power movement and also buying large amounts of drugs from his mafia neighbors. There were also several incidents played down by his people where Jimmy had hit and beaten up groupies. And disturbingly for Hendrix, crowds had started rioting at his concerts. Since the infamous Rolling Stones Altamont concert, any thoughts of peace or love were long gone. In late 1969, you had Altamont, and uh, it was quite a different festival than Woodstock. I mean, here you have the security patrolling the crowd, watching, you know, that things don't get out of hand, but they're all drunk and, and high on pot and dope and whatever at the time there. And so the, uh, the end of the 60s, you know, were actually closed with Altamont. In June 1970, the album Band of Gypsies was released, with all proceeds going to Ed Chalpin. Jimmy was broke, with his royalties still frozen. By July of that year, Jimmy was exhausted from stress and drugs. The only way he could get through a tour was on acid, going yet another place, not knowing where your head is, another terminal, another set of changes, another row of limos waiting, engines running. Later in July, Jimmy went to the island of Maui in Hawaii to make the film Rainbow Bridge. Directed by Andy Warhol protege Chuck Wine. The reason that Jimmy did Rainbow Bridge is we wanted to get a certain idea of what was happening, the hip experience, not any particular metaphysical axe to grind, but that there were people who dropped out of the culture, who weren't so much interested in the material. Melinda Merriweather played Jimmy's lover on and off camera. Of course I loved him. It was, he was hard not to love. He was hard not to love. There was, there was, he was a, truly a wonderful, amazing human being. And again, I will say all the strength and all the things that he presented, his real self was so humble and so beautiful and so precious. Everyone, including the cast, crew, and audience, were wrecked for a month on hash, booze, cocaine, and acid. The film is a rambling shambles that plunges the depths of inanity. During filming, Jimmy was depressed and predicting his own death. I'd asked him, would he be going, would he be going back to Seattle? Like he said, next time I go to Seattle, it'll be in a pine box. One day, I went to Jimmy and I said, Chuck said that you get to make the scene today. You get to choose what you want to shoot. And he looked me square in the eyes and said, I won't be here. And I said, what do you mean won't be here? He says, it's because I, I won't be in my body, I'll be dead. There's a scene in, 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 in Rainbow Bridge, there's a scene with Jimmy in the attic. And to me, if somebody was to say, what's Jimmy really like? I would say, go look at that scene in the attic. The first part of it's a little difficult. He kind of struggles with it and, and Chuck struggles with him, but he eventually falls into his own self. He talks about his self, himself in school. He talks about uh, flying over, the desert, um, and he, he, there's a part of him that is just so much him, and he sort of goes back into past lives, and then he sort of ends it with choking on the grape. That's why I'm laying there playing the part. The grape chokes me almost, but I can't let the joke come out. And indeed, you know, that's what happened, and that's kind of the end of that, of, of, the, of that interview. And and uh, I remember when it when it happened, I just I just when I and I heard about it on the news, the first thing I remember was just seeing again in my mind that scene in the attic. When Jimmy told me that he wasn't going to be here, there was no future to talk about. You know, and I really knew he was telling me the truth when he told me that. And it was what three months later that he died. When he left Maui, I remember when he got in the plane that day, and um, he was in the plane window. And he pointed at me and he sort of went like this. He pointed behind me and went like this. And I looked behind me and there was the most amazing rainbow that sp spread completely over my head and the whole valley was just full of rainbows. And he gave me one of these sort of like they give you in the, in the, in the pilot, the old pilot movies. And, and, uh, and I knew that was it. I knew that was it. There will always be, there is a space in my heart for Jimmy. I mean, Jimmy sits in my, in my heart. I hear some songs to this day and I still cry when I hear them you know I just still when I hear his music I still I still can't get enough of it I still can't get enough of it and an uncanny things happens to me continually I'll walk into 
into a store or a bar or a restaurant and Jimmy's music will, will just come on. It's just, it's uncanny. Jimmy came to the UK on September the 1st to face numerous personal and musical problems. Chas Chandler at the time said that uh, he was fed up with Michael Jeffrey. His contract was going to be ending in December. You have this other element too. His band had just dissolved. Mitch Mitchell's uh, wife just gave birth to uh, their baby. Billy Cox had tried LSD for the first time and had a horrible experience. He was paranoid. The band is dissolved. Yet the contracts still required him to play Paris and, and Belgium and possibly even Japan, and so there was that pressure on them to, there too. Meanwhile, the record companies are demanding new product. You know, there hasn't been this fourth studio album that they've been promised in a year. So a lot of things are overdue. Add to that now, you've got two women that he had been briefly with over the years had hit him with paternity suits. Between the paternity suits, two engagements, and no band to play with. There was total, a total state of chaos and confusion. Jimmy played the Isle of Wight Festival and the next day played a concert in Aarhus in Denmark. He told the crowd, I've been dead a long time. And yet again, he walked off. Jimmy's last ever public appearance was at the Isle of Feman Festival in Germany, which again turned into a riot. The mob ruled and German bikers and Hells Angels shot up the venue, including the medical tent and the stage. They robbed the box office and took control. Jimmy and his band fled in terror. It now seemed that Jimmy's descent into hell was nearly complete. In London, Jimmy was spending time with Monica Dannemann, the daughter of a wealthy German industrialist. He had met this young lady, a ice skating teacher named Monica Damon in 1969, early 1969. Uh, she and her reports have said, has said that um, she was a bit naive to the rock and roll scene. You know, the, the reports at the time when Jimi Hendrix came to town said, watch out girls, Jimi Hendrix is coming to town, you know, mothers, lock up your daughters, here comes Jimi Hendrix. So she went to, to see him, uh, the bro her brother was a fan, and met him briefly and um, According to her account, she fell in love with him, and she has also said that they were engaged shortly after, although she never came forward and proved that or documented that. I think Monica Dannemann was all about Monica Dannemann. I think she was a, a, a kind of fan-obsessed groupy figure. On the night of the 17th of September 1970, journalist Keith Altam took Jimmy to Mike Nesmith's party at the Inn on the Park. Altam noted that Jimmy was very depressed. At the same time, Ed Chalpin was flying into London expecting to meet Jimmy. Jimmy was supposed to go to a meeting with Chalpin and representatives of Polydor and Track Records. Chalpin was still chasing Jimmy for more money. Jimmy Hendrix went into hiding. On September the 18th, 1970, the world learned that one of history's greatest guitarists was dead. Monica Dannemann told the inquest into Jimmy's death, Jimmy slept well on Tuesday and Wednesday night. I don't know about Thursday night. We arrived home at 8.30, I cooked a meal, and we had a bottle of white wine about 11 p.m. Had nothing to drink apart from the wine. I had a bath and washed my hair, and then we talked. There was no argument or stress, no unhappy atmosphere. I took a sleeping tablet about 7 a.m. I made him two tuna fish sandwiches and we were in bed talking. I woke about 10.20 a.m. He was sleeping normally. I went to get cigarettes and when I came back, I got back into bed. He was breathing and his pulse was normal, but I could not wake him. Jimmy. 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 Jimmy! Oh, fucking hell. Jimmy! Hi. It's me. It's, it's Jimmy. I can't wake him up. I'm scared that if I call an ambulance, he'll get cross with me when he wakes up. 
there were nine of my sleeping tablets missing. Jimmy! When I saw him before he went to sleep, he was very happy. The ambulance didn't arrive until 11.30. And the ambulance men reassured me that Jimmy would be all right. I can't wake him. What's wrong with him? Please tell me what's wrong with him. He won't move, he won't respond. Jimmy, come on, wake up. Have you been drinking? Don't worry, don't worry. No, he hasn't been drinking anything. We had some white wine with dinner and that was it. Don't worry, darling. Get in there as soon as you can. Can you, can you tell me what's wrong with him? Well, we'll find that out. He's not going to die, worry, is he? Don't worry. He's not going to die. Okay, one, Be careful, two, careful with him. Three. Careful with him. Jimmy, he is going to live, isn't he? Yes. Can I come with you? OK, OK, how long? I'll be one minute. He is going to live, isn't he? Really, don't worry about it. We'll just take it down to the local hospital and have a check. Can I come with you? Yes, he says yes. this. We get dressed quickly, though. Get dressed. OK, 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 you just look after him, all right? Jimmy, oh, don't worry, babe. I'm going to be with you soon. I travelled with Jimmy in the ambulance all the way to the hospital and waited in the car park for news. Somebody get his head up. Get the mask on him. OK, we need some oxygen. All right, come on, Jimmy. Come on, wake up. Come on, get his okay, head up. Get, get his head up. Come OK, he's got a weak pulse. A nurse came to speak to me and told me that Jimmy was in bad shape. She did, however, say that a medical team hoped they could save him. His lungs collapsed, but there is still a chance that we can save him. OK, people started. What's happening? People started. Oh, come on, people, speak to me. Oh, Tell me what's going on. OK, his pulse is getting weaker. We need some more oxygen. Come on, Jimmy, wake up. We're losing him. Come on. Come on, we're going to lose him. Come on, what's happening? Come on, where's his pulse? Come on, what's happening? Let's get some more oxygen to him now. Come on, we're going to lose this guy. Come on. Come on, Jimmy. Okay. Okay, Blood we're losing him. We need more pressure. We need more pressure now. Blood pressure's gone. Stop. He's dead. There's no pulse. There's no okay. pulse. Are you going to call it? Time of death. Despite the doctors working furiously to resuscitate him, Jimmy's life could not be saved. The news of Jimmy's death was broken to me by a nurse in the car park. It was only when I saw Jimmy's dead body that I could believe he'd passed away. The headlines screamed that Hendrix had died the typical rock star death a drugs overdose amid fame, opulence, and decadence. The inquest found that Jimmy had died from inhaling his own vomit after taking Monica's barbiturate sleeping tablets. The inquest accepted completely Monica's story, but left an open verdict, which meant that the actual circumstances of the death could not be determined. Monica was the only witness called. None of the medical team or ambulance men were consulted. After Jimmy's death, rumours abounded. One had him overdosing on heroin at a friend's flat and his body taken and placed in Monica's flat. Another had him flown to Hollywood, murdered and flown back on a private jet. And yet another rumour had him die at a famous rock star's apartment with Devon by his side. However, 22 years later, Steve Roby and Kathy Etchingham traced the ambulance men, Reg Jones and John Sewer. They insist Dannemann was not at the flat when they arrived and that Hendrix was already dead. Oh, his mucous membrane's all black. He's been dead for about four or five hours. But it's him. And if Monica Dannemann is to be believed about what happened on their last night together, why was Hendrix fully dressed? Okay, one. And how could the ambulance men possibly miss seeing someone who was supposed to be there? In other words, Monica. The ambulance men also contradicted Monica when they both asserted that no one, apart from themselves, had travelled to the hospital with Hendrix. Well, there's no pulse. I 
think this one's gone, actually. Equally, Dr. Bannister, the then surgical registrar, stated that Hendrix had been dead for at least seven hours when he was admitted to the hospital. Dr. Bannister noted that Hendrix's lungs were filled with vomit and masses of red wine. Somebody take this away. Let's have a look. I'd say, if we can close these curtains. Should we put him into the recovery position? They'd never before seen a man who drowned in his own red wine. You call it. See you yeah. go. Uh, time of death. So how did the red wine get into Jimmy's lungs? The 60s and 70s were turbulent political times, and now compelling evidence has emerged that points to a sinister coalition between the United States government and organized crime, set up specifically to murder prominent leaders of the new youth culture, including rock musicians. Jimi Hendrix was killed for two reasons. Uh, first of all, he had made statements in the teen press uh, calling for the Black Panthers to go to Washington, D.C. and shoot the place up. Secondly, he had done a, a benefit for Bobby Seale and the, and the Chicago 8. And that got the attention of the FBI and a program called COINTELPRO, which was a surveillance and assassination program. And it led to the murder of 28 Black Panthers. Tupac Shakur makes 29 because he was a Black Panther. Hendrix linked up with the Black Panthers, and for that reason, he was a dead man. Contel Pro was uh, fostered by J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the chief of the FBI, for a very long time in the late 1950s. And the original goal of the program was to eliminate, in their words, neutralize or defame any kind of young. Uh, in, in Hoover's exact words, messianic black leader who could galvanize uh, all parts of the civil rights movements, black nationalist movements, and white sympathizers, white liberal sympathizers, okay, and, and get them going into a very progressive, powerful movement. The first clues that Hendricks was a government target emerged from declassified FBI files. In 1976, there were a group of students at Santa Barbara University of California who put in for FOIA documents on Jimi Hendrix. They got six heavily blacked out pages. They appealed, they got seven more pages, and they learned from those documents that Jimi Hendrix had been put on a security index established by the FBI to have him and every, everyone else on that index rounded up and placed in detainment camps and in, in the account of a national emergency. Another interesting thing about the FBI files in this particular case is that they're, they're in uh, national security terms redacted, which means blacked out or censored, okay? So that very much crucial information, you know, is still not available to the, to the public. As somebody who's fished through these files for seven or eight, nine, ten years, you know, it's usually the most interesting, the most sensitive stuff okay, that gets blacked out. That's the stuff that they really don't want you to know, that puts them in a very much compromised kind of a position. We now know from declassified United States government files that COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program, was part of a major CIA operation that was called Operation MH Chaos. MH Chaos is a CIA operation that begins in the early 1960s and it targets basically liberals, anti-war protesters, okay, underground newspapers, um, left-wing journalists, etc. And its target is to infiltrate these kinds of movements, lead them astray, okay, and eventually create enough friction in them to actually destroy them and render them weak and helpless. MH Chaos became one of the biggest programs that the CIA had because they felt that they really had to control these forces, which at that time are, are really gaining some momentum and power, okay? And so they wanted to, the object was to prevent them from unifying, from becoming, uh, keep them split as far apart, so they don't become one huge political force. You know, Nixon was very concerned about this. You had major operatives like Hunt and Liddy, who are aware of all this, Tom Charles Houston from Young Americans for Freedom, comes to the Nixon administration and draws up plans for detaining dissidents, including specifically Jimi Hendrix, right? He wasn't a threatening character. Right? He was a musician. That's where, his, that's where his mind and, that, and that's where he wanted to be. 
But as soon as he engaged in politics, it's a different story. And I think that if, if you're a celebrity, you kind of have to gauge your statements. Because you say the wrong thing, you can end up in deep, deep trouble. But Hendrix's music was so powerful, and it was so wide appealing. And by 68, 69, especially after his appearance at the Woodstock thing, which is probably the apogee you know, of, of, of his career, it's become a kind of icon you know, in rock and roll history. You know, Hendrix on stage with the national anthem, et cetera. You know, he was really ready to become the number one, you know, rock act, you know, in, in, in the United States. And with his ties into some of these black nationalist, black power movement, you know, and his liberal sympathies already, you know, if you had Jimi Hendrix actually funneling money into groups like this, then that would really put them in a position to actually spread in a really kind of potent way. One of the problems that a group like the Black Panthers always had is they never had enough money to really finance larger operations that they wanted to get into. You know, with someone like Jimi Hendrix funneling money to them, that would, that would be a serious possibility. The huge amounts of money in the music business had forged an unlikely partnership between the CIA and the Mafia. Of course, the Mafia had their hooks into the music business going back to the jukebox wars. And then in World War II, the OSS started up a program called Operation Underworld, which entailed the actual recruitment of key mafia figures uh, to operate in Italy and the United States. Right? And after World War II, they continued this, this uh, brotherhood between the CIA and, and, the, and the mafia that continues to the present day. Now, under Operation Chaos, I mentioned that all intelligence agencies have been brought into the umbrella program well, the Mafia was brought into it, too, because they were central to the music business itself, and they could be used to control and ultimately, in some cases, murder musicians who are outspoken in their opposition to the U.S. government. Some of the things that you look at, some of the landmarks, okay, that uh, have a lot of uh, uh, similarity to other assassinations that someone like me has studied in the Hendrix case is, uh, first of all, you have uh, the use of an inside operator, uh, somebody very close, uh, and somebody who uh, the target trusts, all right, but doesn't understand that the, the guy is already has a dual allegiance. Uh, in this case, it appears to be Michael Jeffrey, uh, his manager, who had been uh, unearthed later, uh, had both uh, intelligence ties and, and, and mob connections. Mike Jeffrey is an interesting take. He begins working for the government in the National Service. He works into the military. He joins military intelligence. And at that point, his career enters an obscure phase. So there's little, little known about his activities uh, with MI6, except to say that he was stationed in Egypt and he spoke Russian fluently. He boasted about his involvement with mafia figures, but no one took him seriously. After his death, there were documents and news articles uh, that he had in his possession that indicated that possibly he was telling the truth. And there are indications over the years that, that yes, he did have mob ties. Jeffrey went out of his way to make life difficult for Hendrix. He would book him in Toronto one night, and then he'd have him booked in Miami. And then the next night, he'd do one night in California. And he kept him exhausted. He kept him dependent. and. Uh, he kept him under control. Jeffrey was a very devious human being. He set up a, a dummy corporation he called Yometa, and much of the stolen money went into this corporation. And then it was divided between two banks, the Chemical Bank of Nassau and uh, the Nova Scotia Bank. Jeffrey was stealing money from him, sabotaging his career, planning people around him to spy on him and to subvert his own activities, his own life. And Hendrix, yeah, he had a growing awareness that this was happening to him, and he knew who to blame. And then when he discovered that the money was missing, he filed a suit against Michael Jeffrey. And Hendrix's death occurs just before uh, Michael Jeffrey's appearance in the courtroom to answer to Jimi Hendrix on the lawsuit. Not only was Michael Jeffrey stealing Jimi Hendrix's money, his contract as manager was ending, and he also felt that Hendrix's new music wouldn't sell and he had a two million dollar insurance policy on Hendrix's life. Clearly it suited the US government, the Mafia, and in particular Michael Jeffrey 
for Jimmy to be neutralised. But just how did Jimi Hendrix die? All right, now it's been said for, the, for 30 years that Jimi Hendrix choked on his own vomit. It was said that he died of a heroin over, overdose. Of course, none of that's true. He didn't choke to death on his own vomit. Something had to make him sick, right? So now it's known that he took nine Vesperex tablets. These are sleeping pills uh, the night that he died. Now, it's been said that he died from an overdose of barbiturates. The problem is Jimi Hendrix was a chronic insomniac. He was used to barbiturates, and the Vesperex that he, he took really had very little effect on him. He took two tablets. He didn't feel a thing, couldn't go to sleep. He had taken an amphetamine capsule at a party the night before. So the nine Vesperex tablets he, he took really had no connection to his ultimate end. But when he was wheeled into the emergency room, his throat was cleared, and the physician wrote that great masses of red wine came gushing out of his stomach and his lungs. Right? So as I reenact the death of Jimi Hendrix, he must have been held down, a gallon of wine poured down his throat until he drowned. There were only 20 milligrams of alcohol in his blood when he was brought to the emergency room which means there wasn't even enough time for that alcohol to enter his system. So the cause of death was drowning, and it looks to me like it was a forced drowning. That's why I'm laying there playing the part that great chokes me almost, but I can't let the joke come out. Jimi Hendrix had a packet of 42 Vesperex ta tablets in his pocket. Now, e Eric Burden uh, of the Animals has claimed that Jimi Hendrix committed suicide. If that was the intent, it's very likely that he would have taken all the barbiturates in his possession. So it's clear that suicide was not the object. If suicide had been the intent, uh, and if he had died accidentally, it's doubtful that he would have been fully dressed. He was found fully clothed. When the ambulance drivers arrived, they said that no one else was there. Monica Danneman claimed to be there, and of, co of course her testimony has holes in it the size of the Brooklyn Bridge. Now we know, because he was fully clothed, right, we know that it wasn't an accident. We know that uh, he didn't just die in his sleep. He was, he was in his London hotel room, and he must have been restrained. It's very doubtful that he sat down to drink the red wine and filled up his stomach and his lungs. I've never heard of such a thing. The only other possibility is that his head was held in a sink full of wine until he drowned, or he was held down and it was poured down his throat. And I think this is the most likely scenario because it's doubtful that his, his stomach would be so full of wine. I think he was held down, it was forced down his throat, filled his lungs, and uh, he was dead uh, within minutes. After Hendrix died, uh, Michael Jeffrey acted like a guilty man. He, uh, he came to the funeral, but he sat in his car outside he actually confessed to a, a jazz producer by the name of Alan Douglas, who was a good friend of Jimi Hendrix, that he had something to do with the murder. He wasn't entirely clear about it, but it was clear to Alan Douglas that Michael Jeffrey was making a confession. Even after Hendrix's death, the classic patterns of an Operation Chaos killing were followed. Another symptom in this case is the, uh, uh, the investigation that follows uh, the rather questionable circumstances of his death, which never takes the time, very rushed, doesn't take the time to reconcile the different witness testimony surrounding uh, his death. The autopsy uh, is, is very, very questionable uh, because it basically says that uh, he died uh, in his own vomit, okay? Uh, and a later study revealed that it was actually drowning you know, with large amounts of red wine, okay? And then uh, later on, you have this uh, policy of defamation or degradation, whatever term you want to apply to it, uh, in which uh, the, uh, the target then is smeared posthumously. Discreditation of Jimi Hendrix began immediately after his death. Uh, newspapers around the world reported that he died of a heroin overdose. And of course, it's well known that Jimi Hendrix didn't take heroin. He didn't indulge in it. He didn't care for it. He was a psychedelics man, right? So he didn't die of heroin. There, there was no heroin in his blood, right? Yet the press made this claim. 
I would be willing to guess that 90% of the people familiar with Hendrix think he OD'd on heroin when Hendrix actually never took heroin. All right? And then you get uh, these very mysterious fatalities that take place around the people who are close to him. Uh, Devin Wilson, one of his girlfriends, dies in 1971 uh, out the window of an eighth-story hotel. All right? Then Jeffrey himself perishes in uh, another suspicious airplane crash in 1973. And then the last girlfriend, Monica Danneman, who an alleged suicide, carbon monoxide poisoning in 1995, just before she's supposed to go on the air and discuss and tell the truth about the very strange circumstances surrounding Jimmy's death. Monica Danneman became a recluse and made her home a shrine to Jimi Hendrix. In the 35 years since Jimi Hendrix's death, no one has come forward to say that they were there when Hendrix died. We now know what happened, and so did Monica Danneman. So why did Monica take her secret to the grave? Now let's say that you've witnessed a murder and you're told that you'll be next if you open your mouth, you're not likely to open your mouth. So the police come along, they ask you questions, you provide information, but you have to provide false information because you believe that you're the next target. There must be a way that is out of here Said the joker to the thief There's far too much confusion And I can't get no relief Businessmen, they drink my wine. Plowmen, they dig my earth. And none of them along the line know what any of this is really worth. 